the students keep asking me if well after the semester has begun why are we using probabilities i never really understood why do we why why we need probabilities uh machine learning uh depends a lot on uh, some sense of uh, probability distributions and so the question is you know why do we need probabilities so uh, why can't we do it in most of computer science we don't use probabilities uh that's a that's a kind of a foreign concept in in computer science and it's it's familiar to people who work in statistical physics in other areas not so much in computer science so what do probabilities do for you in machine learning i thought let me just begin with a catchy idea here this is a, a data set that the computer vision people use uh it's called the celebrity celebi data set it's got 200000 uh, faces like this of celebrities and they've categorized as people with eye glasses and bangs and pointy nose and oval face and smiling and mustache and wavy hair and wearing hat what not so they put out high resolution images like this and on the website there they say we can use it for all kinds of tasks face attribute uh, uh generation or uh, face recognition and so on and uh, uh i was just looking at a paper at uh, ICLR 2018 which is uh, i don't know happened last month or something like that or maybe it's not happened yet uh and in one of the papers it's coming out of uh, the uh, research group at nvidia you know the top hardware company for uh, deep learning and uh, their paper is full of images like this and this is one of their images in their paper and these are all synthesized images these are not real people so what i what we saw earlier on were uh, real celebrities faces and so what they have done is uh, used the the data set and generated probability distributions out of it in terms of representation they learned a representation and it has a probability distribution of all the attributes of the image and now once you have a probability distribution you can sample the probability distribution and every uh, point uh, in the in the sample is some representation uh, of course there might be high probability ones low probability ones and so on but in their paper they give all these details in it and said they have these extremely high resolution pictures of non existent people which has uh, been generated out of uh, learning from the real data set So a lot of fun things like this you can see in that paper there's a lot of other examples they use uh, uh the uh, another set of images that are available called the Elson data set for of, uh, scenes of kitchens and uh, and bedrooms and uh, bathrooms and what not uh and you can train your uh, programs on all of those data sets and, and generate new pictures of uh, whatever uh, it was trained on So uh, this particular paper was all about getting it really high resolution how many layers of gpus you need it was an nvidia company that was doing it and it's all probabilistic in nature so anyway there's there's one motivation that this has got something to do with probability distributions we can go back further and i want to be, right begin right at the beginning of machine learning and say why did people start using uh, probabilities in machine learning was it absolutely essential uh to do that and and i'm going to address that a little bit before coming down to what kind of methods were generating these these kinds of high resolution images i showed you the ending point so let's start at the beginning and uh uh can get this slide show here okay so the topic today is generative models in deep learning so these are models essentially probability distributions that we just spoke about and they refer to as generative models in that you can generate samples from it so it's a probability distribution and uh, these uh, models have suddenly become important in uh, in machine learning deep learning they were they were kind of forgotten the early days of uh, pattern recognition we were talking about bayes rule and uh, 
probability distributions of uh, uh, of uh, p of uh, x given y from from which you can get uh, probability of y given x using Bayes rule and so on, where you would need a distribution to be available to implement it. Those methods were kind of forgotten for a long period of time. And uh, disc when discriminative models became important, it's not necessary to learn probability distribution. It seems like an indirect way to approach the problem. Can't we directly solve the problem we are interested in, which is that of classification, rather than generating probability distributions? Of course, you can use probability distributions to do it, but we had bypassed it. And there's been a tremendous amount of interest in these generative models in the last uh, few years. You know, the data set I showed is two years old, and the paper I showed was this year. So it's all very current uh, work that's going on. Okay, so today's talk, uh, I begin with the uh, need for probabilities in machine learning. There are several needs, other than generating distributions of, of faces and so on. Um, did the earliest machine learning methods use probabilities? Actually not, they did not use probabilities. And then why did they need, need to use probabilities? And then from there we move on to representations uh, uh, called generative and discriminative models. Generative models represent probability distributions. Discrim discriminative models directly try to solve the problem that we set out to solve. And once we talk about models that are generative and discriminative, uh, we get into how do you represent these probability distributions? And we talk about directed distributions and undirected distributions in terms of graphical models. Um, and uh, and learning these models and the complexity of learning these models and the method of using them to make some inferences such as determining the class and so on and uh, the approximate methods uh, such as sampling and uh, variational inference these are the methods that are commonly used so that's all basics of uh, probabilities and generative discriminative models and directed undirected and sampling invariant. Then only we get into the deep learning part, that is how are those ideas used in deep learning. So we'll spend a little time to talk about this classic method called RBM or the restricted Boltzmann machine and some small variations of it called deep belief networks and uh, deep Boltzmann machines and so on. And then we'll get into the last topic which was uh, how are those nice images generated in this paper at ICLR, they use something called GANs or uh, 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 generative adversarial networks. So we'll talk about that a little bit. And since this is my fourth of the uh, uh, last lecture, uh, and then the last lecture in this uh, particular series, I'll conclude with some remarks on uh, deep learning as a science, and the excitement of, uh, of working in this field and, and I'm specifically putting the word science there rather than engineering, saying deep learning is a science. Okay, so before we talk about uh, probabilities as such, uh, there's a lot of uh, work going on, you read about it in the newspapers every single day about uh, autonomous vehicles, uh, everybody's doing it. And we can take that example and proceed further from there and at the end, we'll talk about uh, adversarial methods, which uses the same example. So let us begin uh, with this nice diagram here of uh, an autonomous vehicle. There have been many updated versions of these diagrams over the last 20 years since autonomous vehicle research began. So essentially, here we have a car uh, which has three inputs, a camera input, a so-called LIDAR input, which is the equivalent of uh, radar with uh, light, okay, with, uh, with uh, lasers. And then there's an IR sensor input also. So we can label them as X1, X2, X3, or these inputs, because they, they're not necessarily scalar, they're typically going to be vectors or, or, or matrices, images, and so on. So that's the input we have, X is the input, and then the output is Y, and Y is not just one output. We have the steering angle, the brake, the acceleration. All of these are the outputs. So the AI and machine learning is what is inside the car over here. And we have shown here a simple uh, one hidden layer uh, network here, or maybe three hidden layers, because we got the, you can regard these output units or the input units. 
and we got all these parameters here labeled theta super 1 and theta super 2 those are all the weights that are connecting and this is the kind of the hidden representation here and we can uh, together refer to them as a bunch of weights and so it is this network that's going to convert those inputs to the desired outputs and the machine learning part would be I suppose uh, driving the car around in a neighborhood with a human driver which then learns what should be the right uh, output for any given input so we are we are learning this that's the learning set and we learn uh, these weights uh, and of course what is happening in these uh, nodes is the simple idea here supposing these were scalar inputs and we are talking about tensors over here being done in in large scale but anyway if we had three inputs x1 x2 x3 we have an activation function that is these parameters multiplying these xi and we apply to it a sigmoid function which is a firing function which goes 0 1 or it could be uh, a, a rectilinear linear unit rectified linear unit and so that would be just an individual neuron of course it's done many many times over but that's the basic idea of uh, machine learning applied to this driving where we got of course learn these parameters by modifying the weights using using a loss function did we get it right or not we start out with the prior and then we keep changing it hopefully eventually we learn those things which allows the car now uh, going along a highway to proceed uh, to steer itself properly I suppose uh, when it's when you're on the curve it may be the, the accelerator has to be slowed a little bit I suppose but uh, that is the kind of thing that goes on so we, we can keep this in mind that that's what a machine learning program does then my my issue here is uh, why do we need probabilities and uh, this seems like a pretty straightforward structure here and can't we just these uh, lear, uh, learn these weights and do we need anything about probabilities here and so we address that issue next so you ask uh, why are probabilities used in machine learning several things conditional probability distributions model the output so we can say p of y given x with parameters w we saw what x y and w were in the previous slide so we can say it's giving you some probability associated uh, with each of the directions the values that y can take and so we can say it's a probabilistic output rather than a deterministic output that that's one use of it another one is likelihood over p of y x w is used to define a loss function ew is of accuracy which we optimize to determine the weights so there is the key point uh, why probabilistic output well we are formulating in a probabilistic way because we want to have a function we need to optimize what is the uh, the best value of those weights and so we uh, the, we go about defining a probability distribution and using the probability distribution you can calculate the likelihood over a set of observations and we define that as the loss function efw and we say we want to maximize that or we take negative minimize that so it's got something to do with the with the loss function and we could have used accuracy and i'll show you that the early machine learning programs used accuracy which was not probabilistic and then um, another reuse of probabilities in machine learning is probability distributions model the joint distributions of v and h this is the visible and the hidden if you if you take all the nodes and say it consists of uh, some visible units with the inputs and the output units and then you have the uh, rest of them are the hidden units and once you have a joint probability distribution of the visibles here and the hidden's here we have a joint probability distribution over all the values it can take and uh, we can uh, we can use a joint probability that is comes from basic rules of probability once you have a joint probability you can always sum out a variable you're not interested in and get a, a get a marginal probability or you can get a conditional probability so anyway these are some of the main um, uses of it and let's go to the very first program that was written for machine learning which was the perceptron it did not use probabilities at all and when they first thought of a machine learning program they said you know can't we construct a program like this and uh, what we what they did here was yeah, they had a bunch of inputs uh, and an output x is the input and then uh, 
the uh, output is GFX, which is uh, nothing but uh, W transpose X. The set of weights to the X's, where F is a threshold function, yes or no type of answer. And we seek a W, they formulate in a special way, the outputs could be plus one or minus one. It's a, it's a two valued type of thing. You drive left or right or, or what have you. And uh, you would uh, you'd be able to say seek W if X uh, belongs to class one, W transpose X is greater than or equal to zero. If X belongs to class two, the W transpose X is less than zero. N is a subscript for the samples here. Then we say, well, what kind of weights do you need? Well, you want the weights to be such that the number of misclassified samples is minimized. So there are right answers and wrong answers. So we have to train it on data where we show it for every X, what is the right output Y? And then we want to make sure the weights are such that they fall on one side or the other. And uh, with that was an obvious update rule. The weight at T plus one it was, it was the weight at T and then you have a learning rate and the derivative of this function here, which leads to a very simple rule that says uh, you show the samples one at a time or all at a time and you update it by computing uh, the gradient. In this case, the gradient turns out to be a fairly simple form. Simply add the value uh, of the sample that is misclassified to the weight itself. And essentially what it does in this two class case, you have two sets of values here, the blue dots and the red dots correspond to the two classes and you're in a feature space here. To start with an arbitrary line corresponds to, to an arbitrary weight. And then every sample you observe, it pushes this way, that way, this way, that way. Hopefully at the end, uh, it keeps moving and then finally says that is the linear separation. This is what the very first machine learning program called a perceptron, which was invented uh, somewhere in the 1960s. And it did, did not use any idea of probability, it just uh, used the idea of minimizing the number of misclassified samples. So that kind of fell out of the, uh, the way, why disadvantage of accuracy as a loss, counting the number of misclassified samples we wish to minimize. Disadvantage is a piecewise constant function of W with discontinuity. So that thing keeps moving, moving dramatically over. It is not uh, a continuous uh, situation. There's no closed form solution, intractable even for a linear classifier. And then uh, we stumbled upon this idea called gradient descent. It requires gradient direction. It's not computable with this uh, accuracy, which was, which was a, which was uh, a dramatically uh, jumpy type of solution. So one solution then was to define the output to be probabilistic and the output is a distribution. So in a way, uh, probability helped out to come up with a reasonable learning algorithm that we can proceed in a systematic direction which accuracy did not allow. So they referred to this probabilistic loss function as a surrogate loss function. So ideally the loss is only, is it right or wrong? Right or wrong, right or wrong, keep changing. And we're saying, no, let's, let's abandon that idea and we're gonna use some kind of a surrogate in place of it. So when an output can, let's, let's take surrogate loss function in different situations. When an output can take one of two values, so if the variable output can only be one or the other, it can all be generalized to multi-classes and continuous and so on. We start with a Bernoulli distribution, which has this form here y to the t times one minus y to the t. And we are talking about the probability of uh, being one or the value or the other. So that's a, that's a standard Bernoulli distribution, which is the distribution of a coin toss, probability of head and tail. And, uh, and then if that is the probability distribution you have, you define using that the likelihood function and you take the log likelihood of that. And then we say, we want to maximize that and of course we, we add a negative sign to it and then say we want to minimize this quantity. And when you take the likelihood function of that, it, it takes on this form here, which reminded people of, ah, oh, that looks like the entropy function we had in information theory, which looks like summation PI log PI is the definition of entropy. And this turns out to be a, a function that looks like a TN log YN. We're talking about two distributions here one is of the data set and the other is the model. And so that is how we ended. So the students started writing code, some of you, some of the students here started writing code for FizzBuzz 
<laughs> the first thing they had to do was, uh, what is the loss function? And they said, oh, loss function is cross entropy, that's what uh, tensor flow says. Where did that come from? Well, uh, this uh, entropy, the entropy of course is a famous information theory concept, but this cross entropy comes around with a formulation like this. And uh, and uh, and so that has stuck now. It's one of the more famous uh, machine learning loss functions. And then uh, we argue that this cross entropy function is concave, and you can use it's a function that looks like this, and we want to minimize this by applying gradient descent. And uh, the value of the gradient turns out to be a very simple form here. Take the difference between the output and what it should be, multiply it by the input value, and sum over all the samples. And uh, this is the nature of the gradient. Turns out this model has been known for a very long time by the statistics people. They called it as logistic regression. And uh, so we, the, the whole goal is uh, if I have a set of inputs, and I got to say yes or no here, a bunch of inputs, we need to figure out the weights and multiply all of them. And then uh, the sum of it, if it exceeds a threshold or not. And that idea was called as logistic regression, whose solution involves uh, gradient descent to find the find the weights. There's no closed form solution for this problem. It's a, it's a gradient descent solution. And what about the continuous case? Um, in machine learning, we, we talk about classification type problems where the output is one or the other, or the output is one of many. Um, I don't know about the, uh, the autonomous driving problem. Uh, maybe the output is continuous valued uh, because the accelerator may be continuous valued rather than discrete steps in it. And the uh, uh, speed also may be continuous valued. Uh, the steering is uh, maybe interesting. Steering output is uh, not a, a continuous value in the normal sense. It's kind of an angle. The steering is an angle. It's, uh, you know, uh, zero to 180 degrees or something like that. So you have to deal with a output that is, uh, that's an angle, as a modulo and so on, so you have to deal with that also. So yeah, but still it's continuous. So the, uh, I guess the, the car would be all continuous value, valued outputs rather than discrete valued outputs. Naturally they're continuous. You can always discretize it. Uh, there's an interesting issue that comes up in probabilistic graphical models and machine learning. Saying I have a variable here that's continuous, like speed or uh, like uh, uh, whatever, uh, the uh, acceleration or something. And uh, and then how do I deal with it? Should I just break it down into several possible values? It's not a good idea to break it down like that. It's not a natural fit to take a continuous variable and divide it up into uh, into discrete variables. Um, because you don't know how finely to discretize it, first of all, right? Is it every, every degree or every, you know, uh, so much? So uh, that is not a natural thing. Uh, and... Uh, and then there are, of course, better ways of dealing with continuous variables, much more efficient ways than discretizing it into many, many possible values. So this is the discrete, the continuous case. And in machine learning, in the continuous case, uh, a classic problem is that of uh, regression, where uh, it's uh, input uh, is a value and the output is some continuous function. So we are, uh, we are uh, think of a x, y plot of some variable, and you're trying to figure out based on a few data points, what is the function I'm going to fit so that in the future for any input, I can produce the output. So for this problem also, we can come up with a surrogate loss function, just as in the case of uh, two class problem we saw with Bernoulli. Here we're using a normal distribution over here. And then so we end up with uh, a, a loss function that looks like this. And the loss function can conveniently says, what you have to do is minimize the squared error. There's a motivation for squared error. Students come and say, why should I use uh, uh, sum of squared errors? Why can't I use uh, just differences? Of what's the difference between what it should have been and what it's outputting? That's the error. Or uh, why not to the power of three? Or why not to the power of four? And so on, right? So here is the answer that if you're working with a modeling with a normal distribution, it turns out sum of squared errors is the right thing to do. So this norm here, yn minus tn squared, squared is the Euclidean norm here, or the L2 norm, as opposed to an L1 norm or an L3 norm or something like that. So that's what it comes out. And again, uh, the derivative here turns out to be, have a simple form, take the differences, just like in the other case. So whether they're continuous or discrete, 
uh, you have. So, so all of this is saying that a probabilistic formulation where are dealing with the outputs as random variables, uh, modeling it in this way leads, leads you to convenient forms of loss functions and gradients and so on. Okay, there are a few other things about surrogates. These are surrogates. Surrogates may learn more. Using log likelihood surrogate uh, test set 0, 1 loss, we call, refer to as 0, 1. Uh, okay, yeah, the other case is 0, 1 loss. Did it get it right or wrong? The test set 0, 1 loss continues to decrease for a long time after the training set 0, 1 loss has reached 0 in training. So it can do better than simply uh, doing right on the data set. Uh, because one can improve classifier robustness by further pushing the classes apart, results in a more confident and robust classifier, extracting more information from the training data, so on. This, okay, this is the stage for why we need to determine the conditional distribution P Y given X. So this is kind of a starting point if you're fundamentally asking the question, why probability? And this sets the stage. From this point onwards, it's all about probability distributions. The entire uh, field of GANs and so on is all about learning probability distributions of those faces or whatever other data set. All right, another thing to keep in mind for those of you who are need to get familiarized more with probabilities because that's what this is all about. Uh, if supposing we have a situation where an input X and an output Y, X I've shown in bold indicating it's some kind of a vector and Y is uh, presumably a scalar value here. And if I give you four data points of x and y as uh, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 0, and 2, 1, then the joint probability distribution of p of x, y can be written as a table here for any combination of x's and y's. These are the probabilities from this data set. For instance, x equal to 1, y equal to 0, the probability is 1 half, you know, right? 2 out of 4, right? So on. And, uh, so that's a, a joint distribution of x and y, and you got to keep in mind here that a conditional distribution, p of y given x, that's a very different thing than p of x comma y. This is a kind of confusion for students when they're starting out learning probabilities. The conditional distribution y given x for that same data set with x uh, uh, 1 and 2 and y equal to 0 and 1 looks like 1, 1 half, 0 half. It's quite different looking table than that. So the conditional distribution is quite different. And, uh, but the thing is, if I give you the, the uh, joint distribution table here, I can reconstruct the conditional distribution using Bayes rule as seen next. So the joint distribution contains information that can be used to generate any, any other distribution. Now, the problem of classification is to determine conditionals. We are always saying, I've given you an X and I need the classification as, to, as Y. So uh, we can, given the joint distribution P of X comma Y, I can compute Y given X. That is, I give you as input X, what's the probability or all the possible values the output can take. If I know the joint of these, I can divide it by this marginal. The way to get the marginal from is uh, that marginal can be obtained from the joint by summing out this variable. So using this simple Bayes rule, we can calculate from the joint, right? Okay. So the joint distribution can be used. And also one more thing is the joint distribution is useful for other purposes. For example, you could use PXY to generate likely XY pairs. Um, and there are examples of uh, both types of classifiers. That is, you can use uh, the condition. So discriminative algorithms directly model PY given X. And the generative models uh, go about modeling PX comma Y. But the goal is to get Y given X. And using the Joint, you can also do that, or you can directly estimate the value of p y given x. So over the years, there have been many different machine learning models used in practice. Some are based on generative models, some are based on discriminative models, and they all got famous names to it also. So we can look at uh, a famous classifier called a naive Bayes classifier. Uh, where we have a set of inputs, x's, and uh, it's a generative model here. When the values of x's are given, we have a joint probability distribution that is modeled. And the corresponding uh, method among discriminative classifiers, uh, modeling p of y given x was logistic regression. So we refer to logistic regression as a discriminative classifier. We refer to naive Bayes as a generative classifier. That's only for a single input. 
And if you have a whole sequence of inputs, uh, we can go to this side here. The naive Bayes in the, with the sequence of inputs it has been referred to as a hidden Markov model, the famous method for recognizing speech. That was the old approach to recognizing speech was based on hidden Markov model. It was again based on a joint probability distribution between y and x, whereas uh, the logistic regression when we go to a sequence scenario, you get a, uh, this is a factor, this is what's called a factor graph here, this represents factors here. And this particular model was referred to as a conditional random field. The Markov random field, which is a, represents a conditional distribution. So in the early days of machine learning, HMMs were the popular model for speech recognition. And then slowly over the years, they found, well, why are we using a, a generative model which requires more work? And there are some disadvantages with the not having enough data and so on. And so they jumped on to this area of uh, looking at conditional probability distributions. And so CRFs became, oh, they're much better than HMMs for speech recognition and those kinds of problems. So anyway, these are all the basic ideas of uh, probability distributions, joint and conditional, and both have been used. And today we are going to be talking more about uh, deep learning with these same ideas. Okay, anyway, before continuing, generative versus discriminative. Generative models which model p x comma y appear to be more general and therefore better. But discriminative models which model p of y given x outperform generative models in classification. In what way? Well, if you look at the number of parameters you need. So if you have, there are fewer adaptive parameters in, in uh, discriminative models. If you look at the logistic regression problem which we just saw, which is I give you a bunch of inputs, how do I find the weights for all of these inputs to decide yes or no? And it says, well, you need m parameters. If you have m, m inputs, you need uh, m parameters. You need to learn m parameters. And you'd have to learn it using a gradient descent for logistic regression. On the other hand, if I had approached uh, a problem uh, in, a, in a generative way, let's say a Bayes classifier with px given y model, let's say as a Gaussian, and then uh, we would we need 2m parameters for the means, and we need uh, parameters for the covariance matrix, and for the class uh, priors, we have these parameters grows quadratically with m. And, uh, and so, in general, generative models, which are trying to model the two distributions, putting them together as, as blocks to solve the problem, you are dealing with, you know, too many things here, and they grow. The parameter, number of parameters you need to learn is larger. You need a larger data set, whereas the discriminative method can work with fewer. And the performance, of course, in the generative model depends on these approximations, is how good are these generative distributions which is why the original idea of a base classifier for pattern recognition kind of uh, fell out of favor in terms of discriminative methods like neural networks, logistic regression, SVM, and so on. All right, so let's now move on to uh, deep learning and these same ideas which really are the basics of machine learning, generative, discriminative, and so on. So the generative models in uh, deep learning are built or trained. So what kind of mechanisms you need? Uh, you need familiarity with probabilistic graphical models, where we talk about uh, directed graphical models and undirected graphical models. And sampling is very important in these methods. You need to generate samples from these distributions. And we refer to them as Monte Carlo methods. And when we are dealing with uh, undirected graphical models, uh, we end up with uh, a, a, a denominator, which gets referred to as the partition function from statistical physics. That name comes from statistical physics, and uh, which uh, needs to be uh, dealt with. And then uh, there's all intractability reigning all over here. And uh, so we need methods for approximate inference. That is, if I give you a, a, a model, and I'm asking you what is the probability of something given something else, then uh, you, uh, that is a problem of inference. And uh, you need to do that uh, in, in, in some computationally tractable way. All right, so the models represent probability distributions. Uh, these, uh, these generative models in, uh, in deep learning, some of them allow explicit probability evaluation. 
the represent probability distributions you could explicitly evaluate probabilities or or they don't allow explicit probability evaluation but allow sampling so you can get samples from it in which case indirectly you can figure out probabilities some described by graphs and factors others not so this kind of opens up a whole range of things that you need to get familiar with oh. right so let's look at uh, both directed graphical models and undirected graphical models and how are they used in deep learning so first we got to understand what do you mean by a directed graphical model and on the left side of this picture is uh, uh, the representation of directed graphical models also referred to as bayesian networks maybe confusing term to put in bayesian network because there's really nothing uh, truly bayesian going on here but uh, they refer to it because of the conditional probabilities that in, that are involved so this involves uh, variables that are parents of other variables causal variables and so on causality and uh, uh, the joint distribution is written like this it's a product of p of xi given the parents of xi and this is a famous example from daphne koller's textbook which is used all over to teach uh, bayesian networks uh this is called the student example and uh, we have here uh the grade of the student in the course depends on the difficulty of the course and the intelligence of the student causal model right and uh, the intelligence of the student may lead to a separate performance in a in the sat which is a college entrance exam for undergraduate students so intelligence influences the sat grade is influenced both the intelligence and the difficulty of the course and this one is of course the professors spend half their time writing recommendation letters <laughs> so uh the recommendation letter depends nothing on but the uh, grade the student receives because they've forgotten in this large class who the student is so the grade influences the strength of the recommendation letter and uh, this is what's called as a bayesian network the causal model uh but bayesian networks are not necessarily always causal it could be some relationship between the variables but uh, ideally it would, it would be a causal model because it gives you additional information the recommendation letter depends on grade grade depends on intelligence grade depends on difficulty the sat score depends only on intelligence it doesn't depend on grade it's got all that information encapsulated in this bayesian network in some very intuitive way and this network is really arrived at by a human being who would uh, who would say what are all the dependencies here but one can but there are algorithms also to construct these uh, dependencies de uh, searching out what are the variables that are correlated and and is it uh, is it uh, causal this way or that way and so on these are all little tables around here which are called as uh, uh, which is called cpds or conditional probability distribution they only refer to that particular uh probability distribution of that variable like grade depends on difficulty in intelligence which means we have here a table for uh, all the two values of difficulty and intelligence the four possible values what are all the uh, possible grades and what are their probabilities and these these need to sum up to one in appropriate rows and columns and similarly letter depends only on grades so a smaller table sat depends on intelligence a smaller table what about intelligence there is no parent for this so it's just a prior distribution 0.7 0.3 similarly difficulty is this so this particular structure is referred to as a directed graphical model and given a directed graphical model the joint probability distribution represented is a nice product of uh, all of these uh, conditional probabilities is pfd times pfi these are just in the, uh, these have no parents and then you have probability of g given di s given i p given l so this is a joint probability distribution given the joint probability distribution i can always compute any a uh, marginal or a conditional from that well how are they used in deep learning uh in uh, deep learning uh, there are all these networks there are like 100 different architectures you can come across for for deep learning and some of these uh, use uh, directed graphical models and actually some of the more recent ones the vaes gans so they seem to be using only uh, directed graphical models this particular one is called a deep belief network these are the visible units and here there are hidden units there are another hidden units at this layer you got these arrows here in a in a directed graphical model you use arrows and in undirected uh, we don't 
And uh, in this case, the inference problem, if I say, what is the probability of some combination of these values, then it involves uh, summing out all the other variables using this joint distribution here. The problem is said to be intractable because it, you have to sum over all possible variables here uh, of all the variables except for the evidence variable here. And we say this task, you have to run over, you can sum over all the possible values of all the other variables. In deep learning, we're talking about large numbers of variables corresponding to the pixels and so on, makes it uh, an intractable problem. It's not only NP hard, it is summing out variables, it's said to be Sharpie complete. It's even more harder than the standard NP complete problem. All right, so it's, it involves counting. Okay, what about uh, undirected graphical models? So this is another thing of machine learning as uh, like many f uh, scientific fields, certain things become important for a period of time, people then move on to other things. Uh, these, uh, these undirected models were the most popular ones and the restricted Boltzmann machine shown here, you got the visible units and the hidden units and there are no directionalities involved. And that is referred to as an undirected graphical model or a Markov network. And these equations here just illustrate what uh, a Markov network is all about. Here if we have a set of variables, whatever be the connections, there are some connections here and some missing here. And these are variables A, B, C, D, E, F. And we say, well, these connections are all represented by these so-called cliques, A, B, A, D, B, C, B, E, E, F, those are the only connections over here. So given those cliques, the joint distribution represented by this set of variables can be written as P of X, one over Z, P hat of X. So that Z is an integral of the P hat of X or all possible values. And that P hat of X is just a product of these factors here. And we say the joint probability distribution now is written as one over Z. And here is the product of all the factors. So this looks a little bit different from the Bayesian network which only involved these conditional probability distributions. Now we have all these factors we need to define between pairs of variables. And not only that, we move on from this to a version that is popular. Again, this comes from physics called the energy model. They, they are the ones who defined these words. They called it the energy model. And uh, we take those factors, we take the uh, logarithm of those factors and we define the energy as negative logarithm of that. So it's a simple transformation from that using the, uh, using a, an alternative representation, using uh, logarithms of the factors, which kind of uh, represents the energy represented by this model can be written as E of X, E A B. So it's, it's a little confusing transformation, but it's a fairly simple one. It, uh, that's what you get out of it. So what is the distribution represented by this? Well, it's, that's nothing but P of X is one over Z exponential minus E of X. So this also represents a probability distribution. So it says when you have a ton of variables, you can represent the probability distribution using a directed graphical model, or you can represent it using a undirected graphical model. And of course, this will involve to know, to calculate any probability, you will need to know Z, which is, uh, which is, a, which is the partition function. And uh, we say that this is, again, summing over all possible values of x, uh, which can be huge in terms of, you know, number of variables you have, all possible values you can take. If you're talking about mega, you know, megapixel image, and uh, what about every pixel, how many values can it take? Well, that can take, uh, you know, um, eight bits, right? Two to the eight possible values, 256 possible values, multiplied by one million pixels. Okay, so it's a, it's a huge number of possible values uh, to, uh, to sum over, again, intractable problems. So machine learning constantly runs into this issue of uh, probability distributions. Next thing is intractability. So this generative models, previously uh, we all know about classifiers. Cat and dog, we've seen that. Logistic regression does it. A simple hidden uh, uh, hidden unit neural network, one layer hidden unit network does it. Now we are saying we want to construct not classifiers. We want to con construct these networks, RBMs. And uh, these RBMs represent probability distributions of all those pictures of faces and things like that. So obviously the modeling is going to be more complex than simple classification. 
In classification, both input and output are given. So for this input, that's the output. And the optimization only needs to learn the mapping. So we say, well, here is a loss function, gradient descent, you can do that. For a, even for logistic regression, we do that. And we learn those weights. But in generative modeling, data doesn't specify both input Z and output X. And so how to arrange Z space usefully, Z is the hidden space, and how to map to X. And it requires optimizing intractable criteria. So the task of generative modeling, the learning algorithms are going to be much more complex than simple gradient descent used uh, in, in, in standard classifiers. And I went over this briefly, I kind of summarized it here into one slide. Uh, one algorithm that Jeff Hinton uh, designed, right, I mentioned before, he designed most of the important algorithms. Uh, he, he, he's, uh, he's given credit for the back propagation to a large extent. And this one is for learning a generative model. And uh, so how do we learn a generative model? How do we learn a probability distribution? This is not like input, output, this is a classifier output. We can take the difference, come back and change the values. That's not what's going on. We're just trying to learn the distribution of those faces. So this says, well, think back about uh, if you have encountered uh, maximum likelihood parameter estimation. That's what you're doing is uh, figuring out a probability distribution. I've given you a bunch of data, let's say the heights of all the students in class, and I ask you, what is the distribution of all the heights of the students in class? You'd say, well, I think it's going to be a normal distribution. That's my model. All I need to do is figure out the mean and the standard deviation. And those would be parameters. Once you give me the mean and standard deviation, I model the distribution. I can generate any number of samples from that distribution given the model. And uh, what is the solution for the mean, the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean? And uh, you can formulate it as a likelihood function and then you take the derivative of the likelihood function and the uh, maximum likelihood estimate for the mean drops out as a simple thing. Just add the samples, divide by the total number, that's your mean. That's the maximum likelihood estimate for the mean. Similarly, standard deviation, that's what we do. Well, same idea here, except a little bit more complicated. We have a likelihood function of a set of M samples, some parameters theta, and we are using here the uh, Markov network formulation, which involves the partition function. So it involves uh, log p tilde, we refer to that as an unnormalized probability. And then we got the z function coming here. Since it was in the denominator, it now has uh, come out as a negative term here when you take the logarithm. And uh, uh, so that is the nature of the maximum likelihood. Okay, if that's the nature, then for stochastic gradient ascent or descent, we're trying to maximize here, maximize the likelihood. So we do ascent as opposed to descent. And uh, we take uh, the term of it turns out to be the derivative of the first term. Uh, and uh, a derivative of the whole thing is it's got two parts to it. Derivative of the first term here and the derivative of the second term. So that's the kind of thing we'll have to evaluate. That turns out to be quite a messy thing to deal with. And uh, the contrastive divergence algorithm uh, does again gradient update. So we need to, we need the gradient, once you have the gradient, you update the values that you had before. The same kind of idea of, uh, of using uh, gradient descent, gradient ascent uh, type of an algorithm, except the computation here is messy. Uh, there is a so-called positive phase to it and there's a negative phase to it. And the positive phase is uh, a sample, a mini batch of examples from the training set. So I said use the training set to figure out this term. Negative phase is uh, use the model that you have and uh, to determine this one from, and where do you get the samples for that? It says give samples from the model initialized with the training data are used. So we, uh, we have two types of sampling going on, one from the data set, another one from the model, the current model. And we use both of these to do these updates. And so that gives you a feel for how a restricted Boltzmann machine, machine is learned from, from data. Why do we call it restricted is a, a general Boltzmann machine is, I've given you a set of bunch of variables, you can connect them any which way you want, that would be a general Boltzmann machine. Restricted says uh, there are layers and layers here. One is the first layer could be visible, next is hidden, or it could be hidden to hidden. So any of these is a, is a probability distribution. So we can learn in a network, not only the weights necessary to do classification,
but you can use the weights to determine a probability distribution. Once you have constructed a probability distribution, you have a very powerful model at hand. Just like uh, the whole class's distribution was represented by the parameters, mean and the standard deviation, I can generate any number of students now from that data set, of course only the heights. Okay, now uh, that's how we learn um, generative models. And uh, how do we use these models to do inferences? So I have this model constructed, I know all the weights and I need to use it somehow to, uh, to uh, determine uh, for given the inputs, what, what's the output, so on, right? So there are two famous methods for approximate inference given that it's an intractable problem. We are dealing with partition functions or we are dealing with all these summations for Bayesian uh, networks. So the methods, uh, classically they've been called as Monte Carlo methods because you're sampling uh, uh, statistically from, this, uh, from these. Uh, they have also been simply called as sampling methods. Uh, interesting, new terminology is coming around which I hadn't encountered. Monte Carlo methods have been around for a long time. Uh, so there are what are called as Las Vegas methods, right? Some of you uh, real algorithms types probably know that. I didn't, I, I, I came across it very recently. So where you, in Monte Carlo methods, you get an approximate answer to whatever you're looking for. And the, uh, uh, and, and the, in the Las Vegas methods, you get an exact answer. But in the amount of compute time you're gonna use is gonna be the opposite. One of them is fixed and the other one is variable. So that's the difference between a Monte Carlo algorithm and a Las Vegas algorithm. Anyway, we, uh, we don't deal with Las Vegas algorithms here in machine learning, the Monte Carlo methods. And uh, we also refer to them as particle-based methods. So samples can be thought of as a sample from the entire distribution. You can say that's, uh, if I modeled all those faces, uh, a sample could be another face. I, I just pick up one point there that, which means a multidimensional point. It's got, got millions of pixels in it. And so that point is, uh, is a sample from that distribution. A particle need not be a sample from the entire, it, it's, it's a whole bunch of samples collapsed. I only am looking for the value of some marginal distribution, some variable. So we can refer to that as a particle from the distribution and it's not all the variables involved. So, so one could get such samples also. So we refer to them as particle-based sampling Monte Carlo. And uh, the idea here with this particle-based method is supposing I have a distribution P of Z, and then I need some function of P of Z, which is uh, of Z, which is F of Z, and how do I get the expected value? What's the average value of that function? And instead of doing the integral f c p of c, that's, that's a standard way of getting an expectation, uh, uh, average value of some function. We replace that uh, with a summation. It's just like uh, asking uh, if I give you a normal distribution with the mean and variance, I can calculate uh, any function of that, like the mean, for instance. I can I can get it out of the distribution. And uh, the other way is uh, give me a set of samples and I'll tell you what the value is by simply summing over uh, these L samples here that gets an estimate. So a, sample, a set of samples is always useful to, to get a sense for what the expected value is. And it turns out we need to be pretty smart about how do you sample and uh, the method of sampling all depends on what kind of a model you're using. If you're using a Bayesian network or a directed graphical model, the idea is simple. And we use a method, the PGM community refer to them as ancestral sampling. So you saw that uh, graph of difficulty, intelligence, letter and uh, uh, grade and letter, we saw that, that model. And uh, to get a sample from that distribution, give me a sample of a student, you can say. We'd say, well, take a, a sample from, uh, in, uh, from difficulty, take a sample from intelligence, these are all dependent. Uh, of course, in those cases, those two are independent. But then when we go to a grade, they're dependent on the parents. What you have picked is going to determine what the next sample is going to look like and what the next sample is going to look like. So, but it's very straightforward. You're just using conditional distributions to generate the samples. And they used to refer to it as ancestral sampling. Uh, but nowadays I'm seeing in the deep learning literature, they're referring it to as forward sampling. 
one and the same unless uh, you think there's some difference there. Uh, so it's ancestral is the PGM community term and forward sampling is the same thing in the deep learning community is using. What is all these ancestors, you know? The PGM community uh, was working with all kinds of data sets, nothing to do with deep learning as such, like medical data and things like that. It made sense to talk about causality and ancestors and things like that. In this deep learning, uh, that doesn't make too much sense. So I think they abandoned that term. They're calling it as forward sampling. And uh, if you're working with uh, undirected models, uh, uh, then the uh, uh, you know go-to method is Gibbs sampling, uh, which kind of starts with, give me, a, give me one sample to begin with. So I give you one sample, some, some uh, arbitrarily constructed sample. And then the next sample you're gonna get by keeping all the variables constant and varying just that one variable and using that conditional distribution. And then you keep that fixed in the next variable, next variable. And such a uh, method has to uh, take some time before the samples are realistic because you started with some arbitrary, maybe peculiar sample that's giving you all kinds of peculiar things. So you have to wait for a little while until uh, it really starts representing the distribution. So given the, uh, the probability distribution, you can get samples out of it. And given the samples, I can always construct whatever inference uh, problem I would like to solve. And these methods uh, surprisingly are uh, uh, quite accurate and you don't need huge numbers of samples to solve the problem. And you know, you constructed the model and you're asking if these inputs, what should be the uh, probabilities associated with different values of this output. And uh, with a handful of samples, one can get a reasonably a good answer, approximate answer using, uh, using sampling except the samples themselves may take effort to generate. That's where the drawback is. So you have to run through like Gibbs sampling can be slow and so on. And then comes along another method which is not sample based at all, based on variational uh, inference methods, where we use uh, uh, what's called as the evidence uh, lower bound uh, on uh, the distribution here. It's a joint distribution of the hidden variables, visible variables data, that's a joint distribution which is all powerful. We're taking the logarithm of it, and then we are talking about uh, constructing a lower bound on that, saying instead of working with the full distributions, can't we work with a lower bound on the distribution, which is reasonably easy to deal with. And uh, then the problem of inference becomes uh, uh, one of maximizing this lower bound here. Uh, and then that involves working with another distribution, Q, and uh, what is the distribution Q? And there's a famous approach called mean field approach. Again, name comes from physics. Quite remarkable that all these things were thought of by these physics people 100 years ago. And uh, they had the solutions to this, the mean field approach and so on, where we take all the hidden variables to be independent and we kind of multiply all these. So some model like this, which seems to work pretty well today uh, in, uh, in, in deep learning. So, Deep uh, generative models use both directed and undirected graphs. So those are all the kinds of things you have to be aware of to work on these topics. So here is an RBM, is an undirected graphical model based on a bipartite graph. Efficient evaluation and differentiation of PV, efficient sampling, all these things. It's, it's kind of a very efficient model to work with RBMs. Deep belief networks are a hybrid graphical model with multiple hidden layers. There are hidden layers now. And uh, sampling is Gibbs for the top layers and ancestral for the lower, because this is directed and that's undirected. Trained using contrastive divergence, which we just saw that. And then we have deep Boltzmann machines. These are all undirected models stacked one on top of the other. Visible units, hidden units, hidden units. So it's an undirected graphical model with several layers of latent variables. But it, this can be rewritten as a bipartite graph structure and use same equations as for RBM. So these are like families of, of methods which uh, were all uh, generative models. As I said earlier on, generative models were not very popular. They were kind of uh, took a back seat until recently. So and there is a, a lot of theory now in differentiable generator nets. Many generative models are based on the idea of using a differentiable generator network. And the model transfers samples of latent variables Z to samples X out of distributions using a differentiable function represented by a neural network. So the neural network, we've chosen things here with differentiation in mind, including 
uh, the uh, activation functions and so on. And so these are uh, generative models and, uh, and, and so the famous uh, class of methods that are based on uh, differentiable generator units are these two variational autoencoders. We saw that briefly earlier on, we'll take another look at it, which pair the generator net with an inference net. There are two networks here. One is a generator network which creates the probability distribution and from the probability distribution it has to construct the input back. That's what an autoencoder does. And then you have these generative adversarial networks or GANs which uh, pair a generative net with a discriminative net. Now that we know something about generative models and discriminative models, all we're doing is let's see if we can put all these things together in some way. So very simply the autoencoder versus uh, variational autoencoder, if you recall the autoencoder takes an input, produces the same thing as output, is an encoder into some kind of a deterministic representation, and a decoder that takes the coding and uh, reconstructs. And so, uh, and then we use a reconstruction loss and so on to figure out what is the right set of weights. We say, well, did it get it back? If not, take the difference, update the weights, so on. So we can construct a standard autoencoder. Variational autoencoder, on the other hand, it goes about taking your input and it starts producing parameters for you rather than representation. It tells you here is your mean and here is your standard deviation. So it tells you what I got here is a probability distribution for you. This is what it looks like and that's what it's mean. And, and it says there is a probability distribution here, Q of Z given X, the normal with mean mu diagonal. All right, so it's maybe a very high dimensional in your representation space but that's giving you a normal probability distribution. Everything becomes normal. And then, uh, uh, and then we sample that normal distribution uh, and, uh, and then we uh, decode the image and then we have to use a reconstruction loss, which is the famous KL divergence, which is uh, how similar two distributions here are and that's what's used. So basically in a variational encoder, we have the encoded version is a probability distribution Q and then uh, the decoder is again a probability distribution X. So this is uh, uh, the essence of the VAE and uh, okay, what we're doing here is transitioning a little bit that uh, that's a VAE model and then we move on to the uh, GAN model. <laughs> and this is a nice example I came across uh, these are all papers that are just coming out. Deep Explore, Deep Test, that's the paper, Automatic Testing of Deep Neural Networks. Uh, uh, this again relates to car accidents and so on with that automotive example we saw earlier on. Uh, it says, uh, well, this was the image we saw earlier on and this, the car is steering properly here and based on all the inputs and the, uh, and the network. And all they did here was take this image and make it a little dark. That's the only difference between these two images. And they made it a little bit dark. And this car is, uh, instead of turning left here, is turning right and going right into the guardrail. Okay. <laughs> all they did was uh, darken the image a little bit. So what's happening here? So a self-driving car correctly decides to turn left for first image but turns right and crashes into the guardrail for a slightly darkened version of A. Uh, this is what is called a corner case or something. You know, that's an interesting terminology that they use. Uh, uh, corner cases are peculiar cases that kind of throw you off completely as if something is coming and hitting you from the side and so on. And so, uh, so the algorithm now has to be trained on these corner cases. Uh, where does it go wrong? And uh, some obvious things, it, uh, it doesn't get right. And uh, that's where uh, this uh, method of adversarial method, and what is the adversarial method? Uh, it comes again using these ideas of discriminative models and generative models are what are being used to generate these adversarial example. So the adversarial approach is to carefully craft synthetic images by adding minimal perturbations to an existing image so that they get classified differently than the original picture, but still look the same to the human eye. We have no problem with it, but can you craft these kinds of images to uh, make our algorithm more robust? And here's another famous example that is throughout in the literature. You can see that one of the earlier examples. Uh, 
And uh, how do you get these adversarial type of examples? Is uh, this was the original image of a panda, uh, and uh, and and add uh, add to x an imperceptibly small vector. Its elements are equal to the sine of the element of the gradient of the cost function with respect to the input. And this is what it is. This is the elements are equal to the sine of the element of the gradient, the cost function with respect to the input. And it changes the classification of the image from this to this. And that is an imperceptibly small difference where the human eye can hardly tell any difference between the two images. But uh, this one was classified as a panda with 58% confidence. And this image also had a classification, nermatode, must be some kind of amoeba or something. I don't know what nermatode is. And uh, it classifies this one as a gibbon with 99% confidence. So these are the adversarial types of examples that are that are that, can, that are being generated. It's got something to do with the gradients. They're adding gradients. So the adversarial method has to do with the differentiability and the gradient. Right. So this uh, brings up to this uh, issue of uh, how do you make your algorithms more robust, uh, your generative models uh, more accurate. So this involves a very clever uh, construction. Here you have uh, a generative model. Well, you have some representation here and from the representation I can generate an 8 over here. So the generator is generating images. We refer to that as generator generated images or fake images. It's not real images. It's like those faces we saw. These are not real people, they're just fake people. And we can generate these things. And here is a real training set here. Here is a real training set of the data. And uh, we, we know what a generative model is, which generates samples. And this generates samples using inputs, uh, random noise. Random no For every noisy input, it uh, is able to produce an output, which is a fake image now. Uh, basically, it provides a, a, a representation from this fake uh, data. It provides a, a, a internal representation. From that representation, it generates this. And we, we now develop a discriminator whose only job is to tell whether it came from this fake set or from the real data set over here. Okay, so it's a two-class classifier that is saying real or fake, real or fake. The whole idea is to strengthen this generator model to, uh, and then we have a feedback. This is not the learning part. This is just the input-output part. We input this, output it. So how do we feed it back to uh, to uh, to strengthen our model? Is shown here. Training a generative adversarial network. Here is the latent space, and then we have noise generated, which means some kind of a latent representation. The generator generates fake samples, and uh, it learns a distribution. Those are real samples. And then learn to how to tell apart fake data from true data. And then we say, is uh, D uh, correct? All right. And then uh, we go back, fine tune the training. And then we fine tune the training over here. In all of these things, the training is all done together. So we go input all the way to the output and feedback all the way. So that's kind of a interesting training here in these GANs. So the training procedure for G is to maximize probability that D makes a mistake. And uh, framework corresponds to a minimax two-player game. I Many of you are working with Professor Narhari on game playing and so on. So there's a game playing seems like an important uh, part of this. For arbitrary G and D, a unique solution exists. If G and D are multilayer perceptrons, like our standard neural networks, uh, can be trained using backpropagation. So it's just connecting these things up and going back and training them. And there's a lot of interesting mathematics that goes here. And so what kind of loss function do you use here? Both D and G are playing a minimax game. Ah, oh, old AI. <laughs> right? Old AI used to begin with alpha, beta, and minimax, and things like that. So some old AI ideas are uh, still useful. And uh, this is uh, playing a minimax game in which we should optimize the following loss function. Min over G and max over D, L of DG, we can express it as expectations over here. And there are all kinds of solutions now for dealing with that. And uh, there is now a ton of uh, papers coming out of the idea of GAN, which is now three years old or something. So that is ancient. So, so there are now a hundred different uh, methods based on GANs. And what are these papers addressing? Um, 
hard to achieve Nash equilibrium. All right, two models trained simultaneously may not converge. It doesn't kind of settle down. You're kind of competing with each other. It doesn't settle down. And then uh, this is a classic problem in machine learning: vanishing gradient. So there is numerical methods involved in throughout in machine learning. You're talking about gradients of tensors and so on. And when you take uh, gradients, uh, sometimes it can become zero, and uh, which means uh, no learning happens. If gradient is zero, you're not changing anything. Extremely small it has become. So vanishing gradient is called. And there are many methods in the numerical uh, parts in deep learning where you have to uh, see how do you ha tackle this. Uh, that's a GAN problem. If discriminator behaves badly, generator does not have feedback. If discriminator does a great job, gradient uh, drops to zero and learning is super slow. So there is that issue. And then this is a more famous one called mode collapse. During training, generator may collapse to a setting where it always produces the same outputs. So that seemed like a very nice thing to generate those uh, things, how to corrupt the, uh, the panda to become a given. Uh, but it seems like you have to work hard to, uh, to do those kinds of things. And uh, I just put one up here. As I said, there are many, many uh, different variations people are writing all the time. And uh, this one seemed interesting to me and seems to be getting important. It's called the Wasserstein GAN or a W GAN. Um, the Wasserstein uh, comes from a method for comparing distributions. And uh, if I have uh, if I have two probability distributions and I ask you, how different are they? Which I think of it as histograms. Uh, one histogram of these variables, another histogram of these variables. They're all kinds of statistic examples, right? There's one shoe store and another shoe store. A company owns two, Bata owns two shoe stores. And they want to know whether these two distributions of sales of their different models of shoes are the same or not. And they're looking at the two distributions. They're not quite the same, but how different are they? It says uh, you use what's called an earth mover distance which says uh, move the earth from some of these peaks to the lower ones and how much earth did you have to move to make them the same? What's the smallest amount? It's called as the earth mover distance. And uh, Wasserstein is a generalization of earth mover distance, not to discrete variables, but to continuous variables. And uh, uh, so, you, you, so you, after all, we're dealing with KL divergence, things like that we talked about in the variational methods. And this one uh, prefers the uh, Wasserstein method of comparing distributions. And uh, while GANs output a probability, a W GAN outputs a, a value. They say W GAN, the discriminator is not outputting a probability, but it's uh, what's called a critic. It is saying how good there is some value it, it, it's, it's outputting. Advantages of this are that it improves the stability of learning, gets rid of problems like mode collapse, provides meaningful learning curves, and so on. These are all, I, I took this out of some abstract of the paper saying, here is a W GAN, and say these are all the merits of the method. So it seems like this is all currently developing things. But it seems I, I, I had a I had a class project on advanced machine learning last semester. The second one was, uh, you know, your team of two or three students pick up whatever project you want and, and, and tell me about it. And and all of them picked GANs. Right? It seems like the popular thing. So I, I had to I had to pour over like twenty different papers on on different variations of GANs. Uh, so it's just a just a rapidly advancing thing. Why are GANs popular? GANs have been at the forefront of research on generative models in the last couple of years, and they have been used for image generation, like the faces we saw, image processing, image synthesis from captions, data generation of visual recognition, many other applications. Not sure whether the language people have, have believe in it or not, but anyway, that's a little little mini wave happening in machine learning. And uh, where do you get all these images for uh, for uh, doing your projects on GANs? Uh, this is a, seems like a famous data set now. Elson large scale scene understanding. Bedrooms, bridges, church outdoor, classroom, conference room, dining room, kitchen, living room, restaurant, tower. Testing set up 10,000 images. And you got training of, you know, look at this, 3 million images of bedrooms, hotel bedrooms and so on. And then uh, validation sets, they've provided all of this. So lots of examples. So you see, so papers are full of images like this. This is uh, some slightly older papers, which is two, as old as 2017. 
And here is an ICLR 2018, this year's paper, saying, look, our images are so much sharper and nicer than the 2017 papers here, right? Um, these are the images from Celebe. Okay, now there are papers talking about uh, adversarial uh, approach as uh, other than those famous. Okay, this is from the point of view of uh, the auto testing. So now the car manufacturers are interested in, you know, give me those corner cases, you know, so that uh, we don't uh, steer right when the when the when it becomes a little darker. So uh, it says uh, the adversarial approach, while it exposes some erroneous behaviors of a deep learning model, it must limit its perturbations to tiny invisible changes or require manual checks. And they say adversarial images only cover a small part, 52% of deep learning system logic. They're saying you need to, how do you test? It seems like a very interesting topic. With these complex networks, how do we how do we test them? So should we just use adversarial methods to make it more robust, or can we generate corner cases to make it fail? And uh, so yeah, at my university, there's a whole research group on automotive testing using uh, these ideas, adversarial methods. So CMU come up, comes up with a new design for uh, autonomous vehicles and. We drive it up to, to our campus to see, <laughs> and we try and see how to make it crash. All right. Okay, so um, in my last 10 minutes, I thought I'd just uh, wrap up, given it's, it's uh, uh, four lectures now. Uh, Professor Narsimurthy and Professor uh, uh, Narahari, they were kind enough to invite me to come to Buffalo. Uh, I mean, come here, come here from Buffalo, and spend a little time with you all. And uh, they shared with me a document from Niti Aayog, uh, which is the uh, understand is the current uh, replacement of uh, of the Planning Commission of India. It's more bottom up. And on their website, they have a very hefty document titled "National Strategy for Artificial Intelligence" or AI for All. And the first sentence of the first, when you turn open the document, the very first sentence that you read is this sentence. It says, artificial intelligence is poised to disrupt the world. And uh, so you have to ponder on this. Uh, um, a lot of thought has gone into it. It's a very good document, by the way. And uh, it's not you know, like simply putting in stuff from all over. They thought about it and, and written this. Uh, my one reaction to this was uh, AI is, of course, part of the world. If you look at a Venn diagram, there's AI is the whole world. A lot of interest in AI because the whole world is getting influenced. But AI lies within computer science. So I'll, I'll draw one more Venn diagram saying AI is inside computer science and that is inside the world. Computer science, of course, is there everywhere. So my uh, uh, reaction to this is AI is first going to disrupt computer science. So, you know, that, that's, that's my personal opinion. You, make, you can think about it. But the style of programming here is very different. The basics are different. We're talking probability theory and uh, uh, linear algebra and uh, differentiation and calculus and so many variations of calculus here, which was all not part of standard computer science. I mean, it was standard part of physics and mathematics, of course, but uh, these are the fundamentals quite different from, uh, from discrete mathematics and so on. So the basics are different. And uh, the, all the methods also, we were previously saying, uh, we have to quote the logic we were saying, if then else, whatever logic we thought of, we want to put that in. Whereas now we are saying, look, it's not so much about the logic you're going to write for the code. You're going to uh, prepare proper data sets and proper machine learning algorithms. You're going to just show examples properly. And that's going to figure out what the logic is. You're not going to figure out the logic. You just are going to prepare the data sets and the computation. So there is another way of how uh, AI is going to disrupt computer science. The basics, the algorithms, and then the hardware also, new types of hardware, like GPUs and so on, rather than CPUs. So you can, you know, you can speculate on this thing. So I think computer science is in for a big change uh, in, in this first sentence, let alone the disrupt the world, okay? So we as computer scientists, we don't know everything about the world, but uh, you know, we can talk about every application, right? How it's going to change this and that. Health. In that document, they talk about healthcare and education and agriculture. What are all important for India? Uh, those are all being mentioned here, and they discuss 
how AI is going to uh, impact that area and so on. So that is the, my first take on uh, a, my final remarks on deep learning is, is that sentence. The other one is another uh, pop, <laughs> another uh, uh, topic that, that, that I like uh, to talk about and it is the philosophy of what is science. And I didn't come across it as, uh, look, uh, I was a student at the Indian Institute of Science, I got to know what is science. Uh, I mean, that's one way to go about it. But I had to encounter it very practically. I, I needed to know what is science in a practical scenario. And that was because for about a decade or so, I've been involved in what's called as forensics. And in forensics, they, they make expert opinion in, in the court and they present in a court of uh, evidence and saying, uh, that look, there's a match between that handwriting and this handwriting, or there's a match between that fingerprint and this fingerprint, or there's a match between that DNA and this DNA. There's a match between that tire print on the on the ground and the uh, and the suspect's car tire. So uh, and then the issue came up with the U.S. courts is okay. You got to bring an expert in. You have to bring an expert uh, who is expert on tires, tire treads, right? Uh, and then uh, the question came in as, uh, who's an expert in tire treads? Uh, and uh, and so they had to kind of define, otherwise they could bring in an arbitrary person from the street and saying, I know about tires. And so a scientific basis became important in the courts. So there's got to be a scientific basis for what you're, what you're, what you're, who you're going to bring in. What do you mean by scientific basis? Uh, what do you mean by science? <laughs> and uh, so these questions were dealt with, of all things, at the U.S. Supreme Court level. So there's a, there's a famous uh, Supreme Court case, uh, Mer uh, this is the U.S. versus Merrill Law Pharmaceuticals, where uh, the, uh, the pharmaceutical that uh, was in question was something they gave to expecting uh, women, and they had uh, babies with uh, deformations. And so the uh, Merrill Law Pharmaceuticals was being sued by, by the party that was affected. And so then they had to deal into who's the expert to testify on this issue. And then they said, okay, before you can admit an expert, it's got to have a scientific basis, that expertise. And what is meant by scientific expertise? And then they argue there that uh, science has to have uh, several, several characteristics about it. It's got to have uh, 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 some uh, general discussion about it has to be had. It's got a peer-reviewed publications. Uh, it has to have error rates. Uh, it has to have general acceptance. So there are so many criteria for uh, the tire testing being a science. And, and the appendices of these things are all written by very smart uh, law interns who work with the Supreme Court judges in the U.S. and so on. So they, were, they took up this issue of uh, what is meant by science. So I, I end up reading about science to do my project here. And uh, it's very interesting that in science, uh, there's, a whole, there's a whole thing called philosophy of science where people have talked about what is scientific. And, uh, and one of the most more famous ones is uh, this philosopher, Karl Popper, who, um, who this was in New Zealand actually, he came up with uh, this thing called uh, falsifiability. Saying if you have a particular a theory about why this phenomenon happens, to, be, to say that it's a scientific theory, uh, it should be stated in such a way that people could go out and do some experiments and falsify it. If nobody can go and test that, then it's not a scientific theory. A scientific theory has to be testable. Uh, and so that's called the falsifiability principle, and it was an underlying principle of, uh, of science for a long time. There have been other uh, people who have, who have talked about uh, uh, what do you mean by, by some being scientific? And uh, one famous or infamous person who came after him is another philosopher of science called Thomas Kuhn. And uh, Kuhn had this uh, thing that science is something that's generally accepted at any given point of time and it might dramatically change later point of time. So here we said, this is the scientific explanation. And then we say, no, that's what changed. This is the scientific explanation. Here is an example of this is the Newtonian mechanics and quantum physics. So in Newtonian mechanics, there was a, a particular explanation of all phenomena, and then quantum theory came about in physics, saying, "Well, that was wrong, and it was uh, mostly right, but you got to fix it with all of these things." I see this area of machine learning, deep learning, kind of reflecting itself. Uh, what happened broad in physics and things like that? 
So uh, we can look at it at the macro and the micro level. Macro is, OK, there was old AI, right? There was all the expert systems and simple machine learning. Now we have deep learning. OK, paradigm shifts happening. That's what Kuhn was talking about. The paradigm shift. He used, the, apparently, he is the one who used the first time the phrase paradigm shift has taken place. He used that phrase. It's kind of stuck now, paradigm shift. And, uh, and he also called it the bandwagon effect. So here is a bandwagon moving along. Everybody jumps on top of it saying, I want to be in the bandwagon. Uh, well, AI was there, expert system, there was a bandwagon. And then simple machine learning, maybe another bandwagon. Now deep learning is, a, is another bandwagon. So you can be cynical about it and say it's a bandwagon. Everybody jumping on, on top of what is the latest one. But one can also look at it. And all these models within deep learning, we have uh, so many of these things, generative models, discri discriminative models, generative models. So again, what's happening is a whole group of people saying this seems to be the right way to do it. This seems to be the right way. So again, general acceptance comes into play. All of us are, are peer reviewing each other, saying, is this the right thing to do or is there something better to be had? So here we are, and some of these things, GANs, <laughs> maybe the current bandwagon. Next year, it might be out. And I think the time frame is all reduced. In the past, Newton mechanics and all this took a long period of time. Here in machine learning, deep learning, this is happening in real time. That every year this is changing and there could be dramatic paradigm shifts. But uh, I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong over any of this. This seems to be actually going in the right direction. We're modeling in some way the brain and so on. So my sense is this is not just a bandwagon. That there's something more solid and concrete to it. And. Uh, be, you know, being at the Indian Institute of Science rather than engineering, it seems like a wonderful thing to be doing, deep learning here, because this is really what science is about, figuring out what is the right thing. But the payoff seems to be great also, because it seems to be working nicely in so many practical applications. So it's a, it's a wonderful uh, once in a lifetime type of thing that's happening now of uh, in deep learning. So, so I hope you'll, you'll also join the bandwagon and enjoy it while you're there. Okay?